several months ago, while looking for ideas for videos, and by that I mean reading iceberg charts and then doing nothing with them, I ran across an interesting iceberg called the Obscure Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg. It's great, and you should go check it out, and I might eventually actually make a video on it, but the point is that one of the entries in the top tier stood out to me. Susie's Dying is a mystery I'd never heard of before, and the premise is very simple. For a time in the 70s, a rumor passed from child to child in England about a telephone number that, if called, would repeat an eerie message. Help me, help me, Susie's dying. The rumor goes that this message was monotone, repeated over and over, and could be heard by using a payphone without paying anything. So, having a particular interest in both creepy things and urban legends, I was immediately drawn to this story and wanted to see if it was possible to get to the bottom of it. I won't clickbait you by claiming that I've solved it, but I will say that I did a bit more research into it than I'd seen anyone else do at the time, and also that I spent about $40 on old British paranormal magazines, so please indulge me by watching this video. Like most mysteries on the internet, it's possible to track down what seems to be the origin point for this story online. The origin is most likely a Google group conversation that I believe was probably an archived Usenet board, alt.misc.fortiana. The particular thread is dated to October 7th, 2000, at exactly 3am, which is a little weird, but we'll come back to that. A user named Katie Stevenson details seeing a letter in the October issue of the Fortian Times that talks about this legend. According to Katie, a Mr. R. Dickinson said that he and some friends called a number on a public payphone back around 1975. When they called the number, they heard the message, Help me, help me, Susie's dying, in a monotone voice, and one of his friends says that sometimes the message is changed to, Help me, help me, Susie's drowning. This is the basis of this story, and subsequent versions of it are all pretty similar, save for one that I'll get to that has details that contradict the other points. But let's take a look at this initial message, as well as the responses to it, first. Katie's message reads, Hello. In the October issue of the Fortean Times, I read a letter that interested a great deal. I'd never heard of anything like it before, and I wondered if anyone could shed any light on it. The author of the letter, a Mr. R. Dickinson, claims that around 1975, he and a few friends dialed a telephone number that may have been made up of zeros, ones, and twos. They were calling from a public payphone and did not insert any money. Then they heard a curiously monotone voice saying, help me, help me, Susie's dying, over and over. Some of his friends who dialed the number regularly said that sometimes the word dying was changed to drowning. Mr. Dickinson hoped that somebody could shed some light on the matter and suggest that maybe it was some kind of bizarre test signal. I too am very interested in this, and if anyone else has any similar experiences, I would like to hear about it. I have tried searching the internet for details and browsed through the archives of several urban legend websites, but nothing similar crops up at all. Yours, Katie Stevenson. So first thing to note here is that Katie helpfully says which issue of the Times she was looking at, October. Since it's October 7th, 2000 on her post, this is presumably the October 2000 issue. The 3 a.m. timestamp concerns me because it's exactly 3 a.m., indicating that this was more of a default timestamp than a real one, and it shows up a few times on other responses as well. But since another person responds the same day, then I think the day and the year are at least reliable, and we can just kind of ignore the time. As I mentioned, there are a few replies from October 7th to October 21st discussing the topic and some explanations, but nothing much comes of it. Interestingly, no one else seems to have seen the letter themselves, which is a little weird since this is a Usenet group specifically for the Fortean Times, and you'd think that people in that Usenet group would have the magazines, but this is another thing I'll come back to. After the posts on October 21st, the conversation goes dead for 15 years. The next response is June 4th, 2015, in which a user talks about calling this number with some friends in 1979. There are a few interesting notes here, in particular a lot of detail on the process, a slightly different version of the message, and details on the exact date and location. This message reads, I can absolutely confirm that this actually happened. This is how it worked. You dial a few numbers by tapping the receiver holder, not dialing the number via the dial. This is due to the signal being analog and numbers were literally tones. You then heard a male voice say, start test, which would repeat until you put the receiver down. The phone then rings, and depends on the tests, you'll either hear tones or messages. The Susie message was the only one I could remember, and it actually said in a low female stern voice, Susie's dying, help me, on repeat. The voice didn't say, help me, help me, Susie's dying. I'm with a friend and we both heard this, so we thought we'd Google the phrase, and here's where we ended up. There was a phone box around 1979 in a village called Fence, near Burnley. Strange enough, there are other stories like this from people in Burnley. I can hand on heart remember this clearly, so all I've stated is fact and not blurred memories. 
Another user in 2016 says that they've experienced this as well, including a date and location. I remember it too. 1976, 6, 7, on Nelson Lanks. I and many friends heard exactly that. Susie's dying, help me, repeated over and over. The number contained approximately 9 to 11 digits. Then, in what initially looks like a recent lead, another comment from someone named Arthur comes in on December 26th, 2018. Arthur claims to have tried this out using the number 2020-2020, a number which is not arbitrary, we'll come back to that, and said that he heard the Susie's dying message. He also signs his YouTube channel's name, and again, I won't leave you in suspense here, this was an art project and the call was fake. The actual video is private now, I think, and so I will be blurring out his YouTube address as well, obviously he doesn't want this going around, but Shrouded Hand looked into it for their own Susie's dying investigation and confirmed that this was a hoax. There are a few other inconsequential responses to this Google chat, but otherwise, that's it. End of thread. The rest of the information about Susie's dying comes from a Reddit post dated July 12th, 2012. This post details a book composed of letters sent into the Fortean Times, the same magazine mentioned by Katie in the first Google Groups message. This set of letters dates from 2000 to 2003 and includes a few different accounts of hearing the Susie's dying message. They're all somewhat similar, though a few have specific details about the number itself, the location, and even one letter that claims you do indeed actually have to pay to hear the message. You can find the Susie's Dying legend mentioned in a few other places online, but all of them seem to get their information back from these main two sources. The only exception I saw was another forum discussion that was clearly about the same letter compilation as was mentioned in the Reddit post, although they don't talk about the source of the letters. So, we seem to have one main source of this legend that doesn't originate online, the Fortean Times. One is the letter compilation book, clearly from 2003 or later since it includes letters from 2003, and the other is the October 2000 issue as mentioned by Katie in the original Usenet conversation. This should be the very first source, since the letter Katie mentions it in is the first and oldest one in the compilation book, and since we know the exact issue, it should be easy to find, right? Right? <laughs> no. No, it's not. Sure, I did find a physical copy of this magazine, and it sure was full of some wacky stuff, but there was absolutely no letter about this topic to be found. And just to be safe, I scoured the entire magazine cover to cover twice, but with no luck. And it'll be a third time by the time I actually record the script, because I'm paranoid I somehow missed it. But my next thought then was that Katie misremembered, and thought it was the October issue since it was October that she was talking about it, but perhaps she meant the last issue she'd read, and perhaps that last issue had been the one from the month earlier, in September. So I tracked in the September magazine. Still nothing. Despite all of this, and just to be totally thorough, I also acquired a copy of the August 2000 edition, but it didn't have the letter either. As I figured this was now stretching the limits of believability, and it isn't super cheap to buy 20-year-old magazines piecemeal, I decided to call that side of the search quits. Besides, in between getting the September and August issues delivered, I did track something else down that was far less disappointing. It happened to me. Real Life Tales of the Paranormal, Volume 1, was not a letdown. This book not only exists and is full of fun nonsense compiled from the letters section of the Fortean Times magazine, it also had what I had bought it for, the Susie's Dying stories mentioned in both the Reddit and forum posts. The Reddit poster had faithfully transcribed the exact letters, which match up perfectly with my book, and the first of these letters exactly matches the post Katie made in the Usenet group. To me, this indicates that Katie's story is accurate, and she did see a letter about this, which she then related from the best of her memory, but simply misremembered the issue it was from. Presumably since this letter is dated 2000, it is in one of the issues from that year that I didn't buy, but since I'm pretty convinced that it does exist and was not made up, I didn't feel the need to keep wasting money. I'm still a bit confused as to why I couldn't find this original letter, but that'll be a mystery I might try to follow up at a later date. But now that I'm sure the letters weren't just made up online, whether they were made up for the magazine is another story, let's read them. Back around 1975, when I was nine, some of the kids I knocked around with insisted we all pile into the nearest phone box to hear a spooky message. By dialing a number, I think made up of zeros, ones, and twos, and without needing to insert two pence, a woman, speaking in a curiously monotone voice, could be heard saying, help me, help me, Susie's dying, over and over. Some of the lads said she sometimes said, help me, help me, Susie's drowning. Was it some kind of weird engineer's test signal, hence no money needed? Rob Dickinson, Warsthorn, Lancashire, 2000. The next letter reads, I can remember once cramming into a phone box in the Stony Holm area of Burnley with various other kids to hear the strange message related by Rob Dickinson. I cannot remember the number dialed. 
Could this be an early example of EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, or just explicable interference on the telephone system filtered through the active imaginations of young witnesses? Christopher McDermott, London, 2000. I remember the spooky message when I was a child, playing with the old red phone boxes in Burnley. Two phone boxes in particular were prone to mysterious scary voice messages, one at the top of Dalton Street on Plain Tree Estate, and the other at the end of Harold Street on Stoops Estate. As I remember, you would put two pens in the slot and press 20, 20, 20, 20, and the voice on the other end would be crackly but audible, help me, Susie's dying, which would send us kids running in all directions. A.G. Russell Dallimore, by email, 2003. I'm from Burnley, and I have a vivid memory of the said phone message. In either 1980 or 1981, three other girls and myself were loitering with the intent not to go back to school after lunch. We were messing around in a phone box near to the school, calling random numbers and talking rubbish if anyone answered. Well, we thought it was funny. One of the girls said she knew a number that you could call to hear a spooky message. I think there were threes and twos in it. When she called this number, we all heard the message as quoted in previous correspondence. I have no doubts as to the phrasing of what I heard. It was a clear voice with no audible distortion. Needless to say, we were all a bit freaked out by this, and when a British telecom van pulled up nearby, we made a hasty retreat and returned to school. Tracy McLean, Narrowsborough, North Yorkshire, 2003. And those are the letters. As I mentioned before, one of these letters contains the exact phone number quoted by Arthur earlier on, showing where he got that information from. Also, one of the letters is an outlier claiming that you did indeed have to spend money. However, most of the others seem to be in agreement that you didn't. So, at this point, here's what we know. In 2000, the Fortean Times printed the issue that contained the Rob Dickinson letter, talking about the Susie's dying legend. This was likely sometime from January to July, as I have the magazines from August through October, and the second letter from 2000 references the Rob letter and isn't from those editions either, therefore it may be late in the year that would have given enough time for the letter writer to have seen a letter earlier in the year and responded to it. So then, in October of 2000, Katie posts to Usenet about this story. A few other people reply discussing the legend, but none of them had an experience with the legend themselves or talk about seeing this letter in the Times. In 2008, It Happened to Me is published, containing four letters about the Susie's dying legend. One is the original, another also from 2000, and then two others from 2003. In 2009, the forum post talking about the letter compilation is made. For the next few days, users discuss theories about the legend, though none claim to have experienced it themselves. One user does talk about hearing a different haunted number legend, but not the Susie's dying one. In 2012, the Reddit post with the transcription of the letters is made. In 2015, someone responds to the original Usenet, now a Google group, with their own experience. 2016, another response is made to the Google group about having their own experience. In 2018, Arthur replies about his hoax investigation. In September 2019, Shrouded Hand investigates. In November of 2021, Spectra Obscura investigates. And as I wrote the script in mid-2022, that was what I had at the time. There is an additional source now, which I will talk about at the end of the script, but it doesn't change my conclusions exactly. So what does this tell us so far? I'm sure you've noticed that there's a bit of a pattern here. What specifically stands out to me is that, aside from the original letters themselves, there's not a single mention that I can find of somebody experiencing this firsthand until 2015. But not only is the internet activity extremely late to the party, but even the 40 and Times letters themselves come in clusters, one set in 2000 and another set in 2003. Responses to the Google group with personal stories came about in 2015 and 2018, and the first of these seems most credible with its detail and the departure from the known story, indicating that they aren't likely just regurgitating things they've heard. The 2016 comment is too vague to tell too much from, and Arthur's in 2018 is completely made up, and as I said, his story references known pieces of other stories, including the Burnley area code and the number itself that was used to dial 2020-2020. So this leads into the big issue with a whole lot of mysteries, whether online or not. People faking things. It is so incredibly easy to tell a lie, and this isn't only true of comments on the internet, but in real life as well. It isn't hard to write a fake letter to a paranormal magazine and have it be taken seriously. So can we take any of these stories to be real? The answer, of course, is that we can't, not with any certainty at least. However, what we can do is to act as if they are real anyway, and try to figure out a possible explanation. So what are the possible explanations that are out there? One popular theory when it comes to this legend in particular was that it was a test recording, meant to check the clarity of the lines. 
This theory posits that an unusual phrase, consisting of a variety of different sounds, is best for this sort of test, so that the listener isn't able to just predict what's being said the way they might with a common phrase. This would also potentially explain not needing to pay to access the number. If it's a test line, it's meant to be called from anywhere by the phone company's employees, and there's no real need for a fee. It would also explain why reports were all so localized, particularly to the Burnley area. Another theory is that it was a placeholder or even a prank message. This sort of thing was, and still is, common, where a phone line is purchased for a particular reason or use, but when not being used for that purpose, it simply plays a pre-recorded message. Why it would be something so weird and creepy is anyone's guess, but it could have been an inside joke or a purposeful prank meant to mess with people. This theory doesn't explain why some reports said there was no need to pay for the call, but there are a few possible explanations from that, from simply misremembering to it being a toll-free number. A third theory is that this is a schoolyard urban legend, but that there was never a real phone number to call to begin with. This doesn't require the people who remember calling it to have been lying, just misremembering, something that is very, very common for events in childhood. Having heard a very detailed urban legend, or even planning to try calling the number with friends, could easily morph into a memory of having done it after many years. This is often the explanation for the Mandela effect as well. And then, of course, there's the fun one. The phone number could be connecting to something paranormal. Whether a warning from the other side, a ghost, or simply a glitch in the matrix, there's no limit to the potential explanations here. The strange and eerie message seems to fit well into this idea, though of course it requires a great deal of suspension of disbelief. But that's the whole point of this sort of legend, the possibility that something so simple could lead to an experience so strange that the only explanation that feels right is something paranormal. And so, for now, this story remains a mystery. But, as a final note, as I mentioned earlier, when I was going back over this script to double check my sources, I came across another investigation into the topic that hadn't been around when I originally wrote this script. Lucia of ghostinmymachine.com did their own look into this topic and has an excellent write-up of their findings, which I'll link in the description. We found generally the same information, including the same book. Neither of us found the actual original letter in the 40th Times, so that is still out there. But they go into much more detail on the test number theory and how test numbers work in general, as well as including a lot of evidence and details from the letters into this theory and how it would work. It is well worth a read. Although I had originally been leaning toward the prank and placeholder line theory, I actually now am convinced of the test line theory. And so I really definitely suggest going and reading this. They did a great job. So that's it. Thank you all for joining me. I hope that you enjoyed this legend, even though it didn't have a fully solved outcome. I think Lucia's article probably gives the strongest explanation for this. I still want to kind of track down the original letters. I think that's a really important missing piece to this whole puzzle. So I will probably be trying to get a hold of the 40 and Times magazine editions at some point. But as I said, they're not cheap. So <laughs> they just, uh, they're going low on the list. But yeah. I really appreciate all of the views and the subscribers and the nice comments. Y'all have been really, really nice, and uh, I'm really happy seeing uh, how many people are actually enjoying these. So uh, thanks for getting this far, and thanks for watching.